So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 19th webinar in the webinar series. Uh, this time we will be looking at Send to Coral um, for Coral Reef Monitoring. And uh, our study area in this case will be the Great Barrier Reef um, on the coast of Australia. Uh, my name is Teresa Schmekalova and I'll be guiding you through this webinar. So first, let's just have a, a quick look on the outline uh, of today's webinar. First, we, I will do a quick uh, roost service intro for those of you who are not familiar with it yet. Um, those who are, uh, please bear with me, it will be very short. Then we will have a look at the study area for today. Afterwards, I will just briefly introduce Send to Coral. And um, after that, we will move on to the exercise. Um, so first, as I said, I will mention quickly um, the Roos service. Uh, just before that, please uh, keep in mind that the webinar is being recorded and it will be available soon within one or two days on uh, YouTube and also on our training uh, uh, platform, roos-training.eu. The whole webinar will take approximately one and a half hours, uh, including Q &A, uh, live Q&A session. Okay, so first a quick introduction to the RUS service. So the uh, RUS uh, stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products and it is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by ESA. And the main objective is uh, to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D um, activities. And the service provides free and open scalable platform uh, in the form of virtual machines that uh, enable the users to employ a variety or pre-installed suite of um, open source toolboxes such as uh, SNAP, uh, all the SNAP toolboxes such as uh, Sentinel-1 uh, toolbox, Sentinel-2 toolbox and Sentinel-3. Also QGIS, BRAT and many others. Also development envir environments such as Python, um, R and many others. So. Um, as I said, the machines are ready to use and are there for your convenience. And apart from uh, offering um, uh, the virtual machines, uh, we also offer uh, op um, specialized remote sensing help desk and uh, training activities such as webinars such as this one and face-to-face -face events uh, at a number of conferences or standalone. And you can find all the information on our roos-training.eu website. So, Talking about the websites, here they are. So we have two websites one that are quite important. Uh, one is the rus-copernicus.eu. This is the plat platform where you can find all the details about the Rus project, how to register, how to request virtual machine. This is also the place where you can access the virtual machines when you, once you um, already have it. And you can find all the conditions and so on for the service. The next page is the roostraining.eu. This page uh, contains all the information about the training activities, uh, all, all our webinars uh, and face-to-face -face events, as well as our e-learning platform where we add um, approximately a lecture uh, every month. Um, you can have a look. So far we have um, um, quite a large number of lectures looking at the uh, SAR data uh, from the beginning up to uh, more advanced applications such as um, uh, polar monitoring and so on. And as I as already mentioned in the beginning, so all the webinars or this webinar and all the others also are uh, being recorded and they are available on YouTube so you can watch them, uh, you can rewatch the webinars, repeat the exercises at your leisure. Uh, at any point. So this webinar is going to be available on this web page as well as in the, uh, on uh, roostraining.eu in a couple of days. So now let's have a quick look on our um, study area. There should be a video which does not play so let's I'm sorry, not sure why that didn't play, but I'm sure all of you know where the Great Barrier Reef actually lies. So today we will be looking at two specific parts of it. One is the uh, Lizard Island in the northern part, and one is the Adelaide Reef a bit uh, more south. So you might have also heard, especially over the past months, but also over the past uh, many years, uh, about color ble bleaching and uh, the um, severe damage that uh, the Great Barrier Reef is suffering due to um, climate change and uh, warm water spells. 
so all of these news articles, which is just a very small selection of what you can actually find, are from actually last month. So uh, there is now new evidence, again, about uh, really an extensive damage that is done uh, to uh, to the reef. And of course, um, the purpose of this training is not to go into depth about the damage that is being done, but it's more about introduction uh, of, the, uh, of the tools that we can use to monitor it. So the first tool that we can use to monitor it, or the one that we will be using today, is Sentinel-2. Uh, for some reason, my videos are not working just about now, but uh, okay. As most of you has uh, has uh, answered the question that you are mostly uh, quite experienced with using Sentinel-2, we don't need a video, but I will still go through the quick overview. So Sentinel-2 is an optical sensor in a polar orbit. Um, it is a constellation that consists of two satellites, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, which are faced approximately 180 degrees to each other. And uh, it is a multispectral instrument with 13 bands of different resolutions. So we have the visible, uh, the bands in the visible part of the spectra, uh, which are in uh, plus uh, the wide um, near infrared band, band eight uh, at 10 meter resolution. Then we have the red edge band and bands and the um, shortwave infrared bands in 20 meter resolution. And then we have the atmospheric correction bands. Um, at uh, 60 meter resolution. The configuration that Sentinel-2 um, offers is a very good um, or is a very good compromise to, uh, for monitoring um, and mapping color reefs even though the different processes that occur um, occur on different time and spatial scales. So uh, the detection for example of color breaching uh, for, requires very frequent and cloudless observations on the scale of days to weeks uh, with high resolution as well, high spatial resolution as well, while uh, in contrast to that the benthic habitat mapping can be performed with less frequency, um, although also high resolution and for example another, um, another um, application can be um, turbidity and sea surface temperature mapping or water quality mapping in the reef areas. <clears throat> which uh, can be performed uh, with, which requires high frequency, but uh, can be performed with coarser resolution data. So Sentinel-2 actually offers a very good um, trade-off between these and uh, uh, can partially satisfy all these demands for all the different applications, as the revisit time is approximately five days at the equator. It offers us a very good uh, chance of cloudless image um, over most of the reef areas. Okay, so now just a quick um, overview of the Center Coral Toolbox. Um, I don't know if many of you are already familiar with it. Maybe I should have asked that question in the beginning. However, uh, Centu Coral um, has been specifically developed as the part of ESASIUM uh, Centu Coral project uh, with the goal to enable scientific exploitation and validation of Sentinel-2 products uh, for the uh, mapping and change detection uh, and coral reef assessment uh, for the color reefs. Um, it includes six modules. These are indicated here in uh, blue. The, um, the uh, grayish boxes indicate uh, preprocessing that is necessary in general to do on Sentinel-2 images prior you start to use the modules available in Sentinel Coral. And there is also, so we have two Sentinel Coral sort of pre-processing models, modules that are applicable to all the different processing scenarios. And then we have four other modules, which are either the uh, final or um, sort of a middle step for uh, different applications. So um, today we will go through uh, three of those. So we will go through the two um, pre-processing ones and three of the, um, I would say, application modules. Um, so uh, we will have a look at the uh, first at the depth, depth invariant indices, then at empirical bathymetry, and finally at the radiometric normalization via uh, the uh, pseudo invariant features. We will not have a look um, into the physics-based module inversion or SVAM, um, since uh, this is a bit more advanced and it would deserve certainly um, its own webinar at some point in the future. Okay, so let me now actually from here go uh, to the virtual machine. 
So um, I will not show how to request the virtual machine or how to um, access it via the web page. Basically, once you are provided with the virtual machine, you can either click on a link in, in your profile on the Rus uh, Copernicus web page, or you can um, save the link and just sign in as I am doing. So the only thing you need to process uh, any data on the virtual machine or to access the virtual machine is just the uh, login details and the link. And this is how the uh, virtual machine looks. So it's a basic Linux-based remote desktop. Just let me make it larger. There we go. Okay. And um, today we will be using Snap because Centu Coral is actually implemented as a plugin in Snap. So uh, let's open it. Uh, we can also, um, so I will not show how to download the data. The first the data set that we will be using will be a Sentinel-1 image from the 21st of um, July, oh, sorry, 21st of August of 2016. And at that time, you might know uh, or might not know um, that um, no atmospherically corrected data have been available yet in 2016 that were processed operationally. So actually, when we download the data, Maybe I can just show the link. So if you here open um, your uh, your browser, it will automatically direct you to the Open uh, Copernicus Open Access Hub from which you can download the data. So I have done this previously, so we don't need to spend time on it. And I have saved my data into the original folder here. And when you download the data, it's download as a uh, zipped folder, uh, which can be directly read by uh, SNAP, which is very convenient. However, um, since we need to perform the atmospheric correction, uh, we will be using send to core, and not to, to confuse with send to coral, but send to core is a, it's an atmospheric correction that is nowadays uh, commonly applied to or operationally applied to Sentinel-2 images. You can download them. Um, the atmospherically corrected level 2A images, as they're called, are available uh, for Europe since, uh, I believe, the beginning of uh, 2018 and globally now um, for uh, since uh, the beginning of 2019. So since our image is from 2016, um, no such data is available. However, luckily, we can quite easily process uh, the atmospheric correction, which is necessary for um, any um, purpose of our color relief monitoring, mostly for bathymetry and also for any um, time series um, uh, processing, such as, for example, if you want to detect changes or coral bleaching, you will need to perform the atmospheric correction. So we will do that first. Since the center, send to coral, uh, sorry, send to core requires data to be um, without any processing done on them. So the input to the algorithm has to be the downloaded product without any uh, any other processing stops done. And I have to unzip it, so I have already done that. And you can see that the zipped folder contains this um, uh, MSIL1C uh, product here with the safe format. And um, there's a couple ways how we can uh, proceed with, with the um, atmospheric correction. So the two ways um, that you can do this is either in the snap window, so I have opened snap already, and um, Either I can go here to optical, uh, thematic land processing, and send to core, and open uh, all here, and process my data from here. Or I can do it with um, the command line, which is my preferred way. So um, I will do it. I will show you how to do it in command line. Also, it's uh, simpler, although um, it is. So it's simpler if you choose to accept all the defaults. Uh, if you choose to, uh, if you want to um, change the parameters of the correction, uh, it's easier, I would say, to do it manually in um, in the graphical interface in Snap. So first thing, so I have, let me just minimize Snap. So I have unzipped my uh, my file here, and now I can right click and go to Open Terminal here. And the way to call send to core is to write L2A, sorry, <laughs> L2A process. Just to find out if I have it installed correctly, I can write dash H um, to see the help. 
for the for the algorithm okay so i can see all the parameters and everything i can put in now um, the easier way here is just um, to not use the parameters of course this might not be ideal for any deeper study but uh, this tutorial is not about sent to core but about sent to coral so i will not spend a lot of time on the atmospheric correction um, but to perform it i will just uh, type dot uh, forward slash and then the name of the product Sorry. Okay. There we go. And then uh, I will choose my resolution. So I write dash dash resolution 10. So I will not actually run it now, otherwise it would rewrite the product that I have already have created here, which would not be ideal. But this is the way that you could uh, run uh, send to uh, core on your data. Um, just uh, one more thing that I have forgot to mention in the beginning. If you have any questions throughout this exercise, please don't hesitate to ask them immediately. We will have a um, Q&A session at the end where I will uh, try to answer all the other questions that might be interesting to everybody or um, all the questions that you have during the Q&A session, of course. But if you have any questions, um, now uh, there is quite a lot of us, so it would be uh, easier if uh, if uh, we can answer me and my colleagues during the session as well. So we don't leave everything for the end. Okay, so I seem to have a typo here, but okay, since I will not run it, here it should say resolution <laughs> that are equals 10. And you could just click enter and then it takes approximately 30 minutes to process uh, the data. Okay, so let's pretend I already processed them, it was very quick, and we can now load the uh, atmospherically corrected data set into SNAP. So if you are familiar with SNAP, uh, probably you are, since most of you is already expert in Sentinel-2 data and in data processing, so um, I will just do a quick introduction. Here is the product explorer where all the loaded products uh, will be um, will be shown. You can also navigate to different bands here. Here in the bottom I have color manipulation and navigation. Maybe this is easier to show when there is already a product loaded, so let me load the product. So I go to original. Uh, if the product is already unzipped, unfortunately you have to go inside and you have to choose uh, the header um, file to um, make Snap understand what a product it is. There we go. So um, this is the product, now it's loaded, it's the level 2 one, which means I must here be corrected. Um, I have all my bands here, so uh, 13 bands. With You can also see the uh, central wave length shown next to the names. And let's open an RGB image from this. So let's click open RGB. There we go. So we can see that the image is actually very dark. Um, this is due to the fact that we have very bright clouds in the image and the histogram stretch then um, sort of doesn't give us so much contrast anymore in the, in the lower values. So let's have a look in the color manipulation tool. And here you can see for the RGB uh, always the histogram stretch that is applied. So we can um, change it for each. So let me see if I can just uh, really by eye change Okay, probably this is not going to be ideal, but it's just uh, for a quick visualization. Okay, here we go. Um, and now um, also you can see navigation. So here we have the whole image. If I zoom in, you will see uh, the window that I can now see here. Um, we have a world map as well, which shows us where the image is located on the world map. So uh, maybe I have not mentioned that, uh, is that um, Sentinel-2 products are already cut into 100 by 100 kilometer tiles and those tiles are already resampled into a common grid, which is uh, very good um, because, for example, uh, if you do a time series um, um, analysis, you do not need to then um, any more resample and uh, collocate uh, these products. Um, because you can be reasonably sure, of course, for some applications the precision is not uh, not enough, but for majority of applications you can be sure that the pixels uh, within the time series uh, really correspond to the same area. Okay, 
so now uh, the first thing that we will do is to resample because um, while the send to core, uh, sorry, send to coral, I will make that mistake a lot today, uh, because the send to coral, um, or let me rephrase, even the, even though the send to coral tool can accept a multi-resolution product, so um, product that has uh, bands of different resolutions inside, um, unfortunately, majority of different tools in Snap cannot. So, uh, since we, if we were processing this entire 100 by 100 meter, kilometer um, tile, it would be quite time consuming and for this purpose, uh, only looking at a specific small area, which by the way, is the lizard island here. So, you've, saw, you've seen it already before, so this is it. Um, so, we are really only interested in quite small area, um, which will be quick to process and therefore we want to apply a subset. However, the subset tool cannot handle uh, multi-resolution data and therefore we need to first, as a first step, pre-process our data and resample them to uh, one res same resolution. Okay, so to do this we will go to raster, geometric operations and resampling. Um, I would advise here, if you're doing this, not to save, so you can actually choose an option here where the output is going to be only virtual, because if you resample all the bands and masks of Sentinel-2 product to uh, 10 meter resolution, which we are going to do, um, it's going to be saving for a very long time. Uh, it's going to be a huge product. So um, let's go now to the resampling parameters and let's uh, select band 2. So band 2 um, is uh, the blue band and it has a 10 meter resolution as a visible as uh, the visible band so um, you can also see here the number of pixels and so on if I chose band one which you might remember is 10 meter uh, sorry 60 meter resolution you can see that the resulting target width and height changes accordingly so but I will cho choose the highest resolution available and I'll just click run okay that's very quick and there we go, I have a new product here. There's no reason really to uh, visualize it because actually visually in RGB it will look the same. Um, there is no change except for the size of the pixels um, in the other bands than the ones that are used actually for the RGB. So uh, we can proceed for the subset now. And to do that, I will have to highlight the product here in the product explorer. And then I go to raster geometric, oh sorry, uh, raster subset. And there is a number of different ways you can subset the image. So here in, in this menu you have two ways. Um, you have pixel coordinates, which are usually quite useful for Sentinel-2 products. As I said, they are already resembles to common grid and cut to the exactly the same tiles. So here you can use um, pixel coordinates to subset even if you are using multiple images. Uh, however, if you are using a time series, of, for example, of Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-3, you would want to generally use geo-coordinates, which is uh, latitude and longitude coordinates of your, uh, of your bounding box, let's say, of the subset that you want to make. Or you can um, basically, that will change both of these, um, just drag these boundaries around on the image here. That's of course not very precise, but if you're only using one image, um, then it might also suffice. But for us, actually, what we want to do, we want to use the pixel coordinates. So let me just type them in. Okay, and you can see that the boundaries in the image here change accordingly with the values that I put. You can also subset the, uh, the bands, so you can choose only specific bands and masks available in the product. And uh, you can also do a metadata subset, although in the, not in this case. Okay, uh, so in this case, also the product is not going to be saved. Here you don't even have an option to physically save it, so it's only going to be a virtual product created from, from the resampled product. Okay, and if I click OK, again it's very fast, and here I go. So let's just visualize it. If I right-click on it and I go to Open RGB, um, I haven't mentioned that before when I was creating the first one, but basically here um, you can choose uh, the bands that you want to visualize as red, green and blue. 
Um, now, when the product is resampled, I have many more options here as well. But I will actually still keep using the natural um, colors. So um, band, red band as red, green band as green, and blue band as blue. And I can click OK. There we go. Now we see that the stretch is quite different because um, while we still have some residual clouds, we don't really have these bright values. Now the bright values really correspond more to the sand areas and so on. So if we now compare it um, with the uh, with the original visualization of uh, of the full product, you can see that the histogram stretch, automatic histogram stretch, is already quite different because um, yeah. Okay. So this is the pre-processing that um, I was showing the first three steps that I was the gray ones that I was showing on the on the uh, flowchart. I will now go back to the flowchart because the next part uh, which we need to do is uh, to apply a correction for sun glint. So let me just uh, go out of the machine and back to the presentation. So this is the part of the, or the flowchart that I'm talking about. So right now we have completed these three steps and uh, we uh, are going to process this, this Declint algorithm, which is the first one if in sent to Coral, or not first one, but it's the first one of sent to Coral we will use. Okay, so you can see also this uh, arrow here. It doesn't necessarily need to be applied. Um, if you have a, um, if you have a product that has very calm water and very good conditions and there is no or very minimal sun glint or no sun glint, then um, it might be better not to use um, the deglinting algorithm. Um, but in our case, we will apply it just to see. Okay, so just to explain how the deglint algorithm works. Uh, basically, uh, we use uh, band 8 or the near infrared band, or actually not just band 8, it depends on which, um, which other bands you use, but uh, let's say we use the near infrared band to um, basically identify um, the contribution of the glint to the brightness of the pixel. So in the near infrared and over deep water, the reflectance will be very homogeneous and it'd be very low. So it'd be very close to zero. Um, so any variability that you will see inside the... Um, so let me go back actually. So the point is that we need to sample these areas. So we need to sample the areas over deep water where we can see sun glint, such as you can see on this image here. So I have made two samples just... Um, um, just as uh, just to show. So let's say I have these two samples and any variability that I see in them I attribute to sun glint, which in this case um, is probably very true. So there is, uh, I do not um, expect any contribution from the subsurface um, um, features um, in this case. Uh, also because I'm looking at near infrared and uh, there should not be any contribution from the subsurface features. Um, in this case, then, we can plot the values, so we can put our um, near-infrared values. We have a minimum and then um, some, so we basically plot the minimum value of, uh, within our samples and the other values, and we can fit a regression line through these. Um, and we plot them with, rela uh, with relation to the um, visible uh, or the, the bands that we wish to correct. Um, so we then perform a sim simple uh, regression between the visible and the near-infrared band for the sample pixels. And the slope of the regression is then used to predict the brightness of the other pixels in the image um, with respect to the minimum um, value within the samples. You can also set this minimum uh, near-infrared value manually. However, by default, it is calculated as the lowest value um, present in the sampled areas. So here you can see on this image the effect. So here you can see the sun glint on the waves and here you can see the deglinted image. Okay, so let's go back to um, to the virtual machine and let's actually perform this. So first thing that we need to do is actually draw these um, deglint or sample polygons. How do we do that? So I first select here uh, the product in the Product Explorer. 
Then I go to vector and I clicked on um, new vector data container. I will name it glint. Okay, and now on my image, I want to draw using the um, rectangle drawing tool um, several polygons over uh, the dark areas. I can actually use another help to it. So this is a quite a bright image of a visit in the visible part of the spectrum. But if I open the band eight, which is the one that will be used as a reference, so I can see the values are very low. So this is actually a very good image uh, because uh, all the values are very very low. There is very little glint uh, present in the image. If I change the histogram uh, a little bit, I can see some higher values here or not higher values, but uh, higher than uh, the background values, let's say. And I can use this uh, to draw my, um, my polygons. So let's uh, draw one polygon somewhere here. Let's say, maybe here. And here, okay. I mean, that really depends on choice. In this case, um, Okay, I think this is, uh, this is sufficient for our small sample. Actually, it might be a bit too many samples, but that's fine. And we can go to the grid processor. So I click on optical, thematic water processing, send to coral, processing modules, and the grid processor. Okay, so here I just have to pay attention that my subsetted product is, um, is selected as the, name, as the input. I can also change the name slightly because this will be the product that will be actually physically saved. As I said, the resampled and the subsetted product were not. So I'll just shorten a little bit because, well, I like it more. There we go. And I will save it in my processing um, folder. Then I go to the processing parameters. Here I need to uh, specify which um, vector container or what is the name of the vector container that carries the uh, glint polygons or the sample polygons. So if I go now here in the product and in the vector data, you see that this um, vector container has been created here. So there we go. And here I need to see which um, bands should I choose. So I will actually choose the first five. Um, that depends because for many other applications you will actually not use the five bands, you will use two, for example, for bathymetry that we will be running today and also for the pseudo-invariant indices um, um, tool we will use two uh, and also for the depth, um, sorry, for the depth um, invariant indices we will use uh, also two bands. So, but okay, let's uh, process these five. And as a reference band here, I will band, choose band 8, only band 8, um, if I was still working with a multi-resolution product. So if I did not apply the uh, resampling, I would have to choose uh, for each of these band or each of these resolutions an appropriate um, reference band. This means that for bands 5, uh, let's say for band 5, here I would have to choose uh, band 7, and for um, or band 8a and for band 1 I would have to choose band 9 but like this I can use uh, use only one okay and I have another option here so I have um, I have this option here to set my minimum near infrared value however if I choose minus 1 this means that the default value uh, will be taken or the minimum value will be taken from uh, the samples that I provided and then I have this option which says mask all negative reflectance values which means that when this um, uh, transformation uh, is, uh, is uh, performed uh, many of the very bright pixels will actually has, um, be converted or will have negative values as a result of the transformation and I want to mask uh, the negative values because these anyway correspond to features like clouds, land um, and others uh, that are over the water or above water so um, I am not interested in them anyway. Okay, so let's quick run. For the small subset is uh, generally very very fast. And we are done. 
So um, unfortunately, the center crawl doesn't really announce it. You have to look into the uh, product explorer that it has finished. So I have the new product here. And if I go to bands, now I see that I have only the um, source bands and also the reference band here. They're unfortunately not named differently, um, but uh, keep in mind that only these bands are the ones that are corrected. The band 8 as a reference band, of course, uh, by default is not, um, not corrected in any way. Okay. So uh, that was the deglinting processor. Let's uh, just open an RGB of the deglint um, image again with um, uh, with uh, natural colors set. Okay, there we see. there we go. So now again the stretch of the values is a little bit different, so I cannot really compare it directly unless I I take my time and try to uh, adapt the histogram stretch to be the same as here, which I can do actually. We can do it like this. And there we go. And for red, so if I check the value that was used here, it's approximately 7. There we go. So now it's actually closer to our uh, visualization here. And you can see that the water areas here um, are uh, much darker due to this transformation. Um, or the deep water areas are much darker, as well as all the land areas have actually been removed. There are some residual values here that uh, seem to have very bright values and so on. This will be removed now in the next step. And also the brightness of the clouds has changed a little bit, so this is again due to the transformation. But um, we will get rid of them soon because they, don't, they do not carry any information for us or for our purposes anyway. Okay, so actually, so that's the next step. Uh, so it's another essential step in the pre-processing. And what we need to mask is, um, for example, the land, the white caps, so the top of the, uh, the foam on the top of the blades, um, the clouds, and also what we need to mask is the cloud shadows. Uh, this tool that we will have a look on now does not allow us to mark, mask the dark features, so the cloud shadows, but we will do that later. But it allows us to mask out uh, the bright features. So we can, for this, we can use, again, uh, the near-infrared. Uh, as, uh, as the near-infrared wavelengths do not penetrate into the water, and so after the deglint uh, is applied, creel areas of the waters, water will appear very dark in our visible uh, part of spectra. And uh, the clouds and uh, white caps and land uh, will typically have very high reflectance in the near-infrared uh, part of the spectra. And therefore, we can just use a simple trash holding to uh, remove them. So let's do that. Um, let's go to uh, optical, thematic water processing, sent to coral, processing modules. The path is rather wrong, long. And land cloud white cap mask processor. Okay, so let me just stretch it. So here again, an important thing is to um, keep in mind that the last product, so the deglinted product has to be chosen as a source. Generally, it's always the one that you have selected here. So if you click by accident on some others, uh, it will be set there, but you can change it here. And um, name, okay, um, then the target directory. And here uh, we again need to set uh, source bands and reference bands. Um, actually, I forgot. Um, maybe I can just uh, go back to the presentation. Let me see. Just to, to give a better, quick overview of the of the of the processor. So, as I said, we've moved to the land cloud and white cat mask processor, and basically. As I explained before, this is simply how it works. So this is basically how the uh, thresholding works. Uh, I already explained it. So water surface uh, will be will have reflectance close to zero, while uh, clouds, white caps, and land uh, will have very high reflectance in the near infrared or band eight in our case now. And we can then apply a simple threshold. But the clouds, uh, shadows, and terrain shadows will not be removed. And you can see this actually on the image below here. So this is the, uh, the natural color image uh, that we created. And this is a mask. If I apply 
a threshold to band eight, which is of uh, which is um, which shows all the values that are uh, higher uh, than 0 0.05 as um, as white. Uh, sorry, yes, exactly. <laughs> Confused. So all the values that are higher than 0 0.05 show as white in this case. And you can see that we have some residual values here. So it picks up nice clouds, nicely the clouds and all the land area. Um, but we have, for example, terrain shadow um, contamination here. So that one uh, will not be masked. So we will need to perform another little step to, to get rid of that. So let me go back. There we go. So here again, um, we're back in the in the menu. So we will choose again as the source bands, the first five bands, as we have done before for the Deglint, and as the reference band, the near infrared band eight. And here in the maximum valid value, so by default this is set to 0 0.1. It may differ for different images. For this image, I found that the best um, threshold that I can use or the best threshold that I found is 0 0.05 uh, and that is the maximum valid value for the mask. So the mask will actually look uh, reverse than the one that I just showed you on the slide. Okay and I will run and you will see the result in a second. There you go and we have now a uh, product 5 created and if I go to the bands, now I see that uh, I have the source bands in the bottom, reference band on the top, and I have a new band created, which is the mask band. The mask is automatically applied to the band, so if I now open RGB, it will already be automatically masked. But this is basically how the mask looks. So all the invalid values are given the value of zero, and all the valid values for us, this means um, the water area or open water area, um, without any cloud cover is given value 1. Okay, so let's just open the RGB again. There we go. We can see that still in this uh, stretch, histogram stretch, we still get a um, bit of uh, cloud boundaries here, the values, but if I actually again uh, apply the same stretch as we had for the There we go. So now we can see we got rid of all of these um, residual errors. I can close this one, this one. And if I have a look, so this is my land area. It's been removed quite nicely, uh, even though now here still the clouds are uh, some residual errors here. So what would I need to do now? is I was already mentioning that this um, correction does not actually remove the very dark features. Um, it can be a little bit tricky to remove those, especially uh, if we have an area with very, very low um, values to start with, like the open, um, open deep waters. However, in band 2, these waters still show uh, some uh, reflectance, and if I uh, change the if I change the histogram distribution a little bit, I can actually identify the cloud shadows in these areas. So what I can create now is actually to create like a final uh, mask, which will contain um, all these, uh, which will contain all of these uh, invalid features. And um, uh, so how we do that, we can right click on the product and go to the bond mouth. We will name it, um, for example, mask all. You can name it whatever you like. But um, and I will deselect virtual. So this tool enables us to calculate any sort of uh, uh, band math from from the um, from the existing bands. So um, I can go to the expression. And what I want to say here is I want to use a conditional statement which says if um, band 2 is lower than 0 0.01, so you see that the threshold is actually very, very 
uh, low. So if it's sorry, if the band two is higher than zero point zero one, and um, the cloud uh, mask or the mask that we have created previously uh, is once. So if in other words, if the value, if the pixel is a valid pixel for me, there, uh, then I want to um, assign number one, so a valid. Else, I want to assign value zero. And now I will get a mask where all the values that uh, correspond either to the mask masked bright features from the land cloud and white cap mask or to the very very dark features that are below the threshold I apply to band 2 and um, those will be um, um, those will be assigned to 0 and all the other valid pixels will be assigned to 1 okay. yes so um, just to mention I have deselected the virtual here if you don't deselect it you can still change the expression later however you will run into problems if you for example want to export only the band which might happen in some cases and so on because this band will always only be virtual you can convert it but still there is uh, some bugs in snap that do not allow you then to export it alone without the bands that were used to calculate it so I just uh, would uh, advise to always uh, always uh, deselect the virtual band okay so let's go here and here we have the mask so this is my final mask you can see that the cloud shadows were quite nicely picked up if i go back to um the sentinel 2 uh, sorry this to the band 2 um uh, view you can see that they they have been identified very nicely okay so let me close these just so we have a little bit less clutter here And I'll also close the mask. And now we can actually move to um, the application part of send to Coral. So if I go back to my presentation, the next step that we will be looking at is the depth invariant indices. Um, and uh, these just to explain how they are calculated. So basically, the purpose um, is to um, remove the effect of depth on um, the uh, on the uh, reflectance of uh, the feature. So we could we can use then this uh, depth invariant index in the classification because all in theory. Um, or that's the purpose, is that all the same bottom types will have the same reflectance um, in, or will have the same value in the depth invariant index because it's not a reflectance anymore, but will have the same um, value in the depth invariant index raster um, no matter what depth they're in. So the point is that um, the attenuation of the reflectance is approximately inverse to the exponential, um, sorry, <laughs> is approximately inverse exponential with water depth and uh, what we can do then is if we assume this we can um, linearize this um, uh, this relationship with this um, um, equation here and then we can choose two bands only two bands is possible to be as an input to this um, between um, Usually for Sentinel-2, that is band between bands 1 and 5. For um, major, for most reasons or uh, for uh, the fact that uh, the penetration of the bands with uh, longer wavelength than, uh, than 5 or than band 5 uh, do not have a sufficient uh, penetration depth to reach the um, undersurface uh, features. Um, However, band 5 is 20 meter resolution and also the penetration depth is, uh, is much lower. Uh, band 1, uh, on the other hand, has uh, 60 meters, so we will um, try to use bands 2 and 3 because these offer us the best, um, I would say, trade-off between uh, the, what, the, uh, the depth of the penetration as well as uh, the um, spatial resolution. So then we need to uh, create um, pixel samples or sample polygons um, over the same types of the bottom cover or the bottom surface. 
um, such as, for example, bright sand, uh, at different depths. So this will enable us to, if we know that the reflectance should be the same, however, the reflectance is being changed by the attenuation of the reflectance within the depth of the water, we can uh, then um, estimate from this the attenuation coefficient ratio between these two bands, and we can then um, sort of um, estimate uh, the relative depth and through a simple regression, we can remove the effect of the depth on the reflectance and create these uh, depth invariant index. Okay, so let's go back. So here we go. So now um, we need to create two different types of polygons. We need to create uh, polygons over the deep um, water regions. Uh, and then we need to, as a reference, uh, low value, and then we need to um, create polygons over the same bottom type, as I've mentioned, which will be used uh, to calculate this um, ratio. Um, for example, um, sand areas, as I mentioned already, are good because due to the brightness, they provide a very good uh, signal-to-noise ratio for this purpose. So what I need to do now is I need to go to vector. So first I need to select the, this uh, last product, so last preprocess product, which is masked. Actually, let's go here uh, in um, the product explorer. And then I have to go to vector, new vector data container, and I will name it deep, which will be the deep polygons. I could, in theory, use the glint polygons that I already have, um, but uh, I can just create new ones. Okay, so let me just quickly draw them. Let's see. Now I, ha I have to choose now which um, container I want to put them in, so I want to choose T. And I'll put one here. Let's say like this. Okay, so these are my deep polygons, deep water polygons. And then I want to uh, go to vector, again, a new vector data container, and I want to name it same type. Okay, and now this is the tricky part because I need to somehow identify the same bottom um, types, um, such as, for example, the bright sand. But not everything that appears here bright uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily um, correspond to sand. So I can play a little bit with the... Let's do like this. Um, from uh, looking at some uh, habitat and geomorphological classifications here, I know that, for example, uh, sand area is here, so that's, that would be the deeper one. Um, I also know that this area here corresponds to sand. And also, for example, this uh, less deep area here. So that gives me nice distribution between uh, different um, different depths. And then to the deepest one, for example, I can use the one here. Okay. So now I have several polygons. I could make more, maybe also in this area here. And that should be enough. And I can go back to navigation. Very well, so now I have um, my polygons drawn, and I can go again to optical, what uh, thematic water processing, and to coral, and I'll go to uh, depth invariant indices. There we go. So now you see actually there is product one selected for some reason, so I have to select product five. And I will go here. And here, I am only allowed to choose two bands, as I've mentioned before, because we need to calculate the ratio. And so I will select band two and three, which give me the best uh, trade-off between um, the water penetration depth and the spatial resolution. And I will um, then put the deep 
container, vector container that I put um, that I created here, and the same type here it's names, so we can choose see if we have them here. So exactly, they're here, and I can run the process. Okay, so we're done. And let's go to the product that was created. So this product contains only a single band with the depth invariant indices. Let's open it by double clicking on it. I can also um, sort of disappear the vectors here because I don't need them at this point. Okay, you can see that actually um, the mask that was applied uh, during the masking process here does not appear here. Uh, so we have to create the mask or we have to uh, apply the mask again, which we can do, but we have to do the same in the bathymetry uh, in uh, the next uh, processor that I'll show you. So I will not uh, show it here. The process is the same. Um, so we can see that we don't really, okay, like this, we cannot really see much. We can uh, use the color manipulation tool to um, play a little bit with um, with the distribution. So let's do that. This is just some values that um, I pre-selected as giving a good good results. And let's have a look at the original the comparison with the original image. So I'll close the number five and let's zoom in. Okay. And now we see that for example in this area and this area we marked that the value uh, is this or the surface bottom type is sand, so it's the same. And uh, now we see that here the values approximately correspond to one another, while we have some dark values here that correspond to the coral reefs uh, or to the corals. Uh, so uh, yeah, we can use then this as an input to a further classification. I will not show the classification actually here in this um, in this tutorial. Uh, let me make it bigger again um, in this tutorial, but I can show you results of very, very rudimentary classification that I have done with uh, for benthic habitat mapping. Um, it's really very simple, the one that I have made here, and it would not probably stand to any scrutiny or um, validation check. But what I used to produce this one, I used um, training data that were uh, taken from a habitat, um, benthic habitat map um, produced uh, uh, in a different study. Um, I will provide you the, um, the references later. And uh, this one, that one looks like this. Oh, sorry. So this is the original one. Um, it contains more classes than I, uh, than I used, but uh, just for the purpose of, uh, of my classification, I sort of uh, visualize them in a certain way. And then if I um, show you my map, you can, or my uh, classification, you can see that the results are actually quite um, similar. Uh, also, something that can contribute to the difference is the fact that this data set was uh, compiled with the data from uh, 2011, while that my image from 2006, so there might be some changes um, to the reef, uh, as well as, of course, uh, inaccuracies in my classification. But uh, just to point out that you can use these depth invariant indices for classification, usually you cannot use them um, only by themselves. What I used here was bathymetry, um, the depth invariant indices, and bands um, 2 to 5 uh, as well. So, okay. So this was the first application, um, sort of uh, application processor present in Centu Coral. And now we can move to maybe the more interesting one, which is, uh, or more um, interesting result uh, in the uh, in the sense of more interesting result right away one, which is the emp empirical bathymetry. So first, let me uh, go back to the presentation. There we go. So the next one, as I said, will be the empirical bathymetry one. And the empirical bathymetry actually relies on exactly the same principle that I uh, described for the depth invariant indices. 
And um, we, however, not, do not need now in this case uh, polygons that show us the same uh, bottom type, but we do need in situ point bathymetry data uh, in order to be able to perform a linear regression uh, between um, between uh, basically in order to per, um, to perform the linear regression to estimate this these um, uh, these constants uh, so the con first constant is uh, m1 and then we have an op offset and to calculate so we have a known depth we um, use this equation or the linearization of the uh, attenu attenuation with depth or change of attenuation with depth uh, for each band so these are these two bands that we select. Then we calculate the ratio and we can calculate or estimate these two uh, parameters uh, with a known depth. And then when we want to calculate the depth for all the other pixels or points uh, for which we do not know uh, what the depth is, we can, uh, we can use these um, to calculate the unknown depth. So sorry for the not very good explanation. However, I hope at least the slide is going to give you a, a good idea how this is performed. It basically uh, follows the same principle as the invariant depth indices. Okay, so um, the results will look approximately like this. So let's go and uh, get them. There we go. So uh, this is uh, the first um, result. So let me just uh, put it back into the same window. And let's move on to uh, the next step. So what we need to do here is um, we need to go back to the um, optical thematic water processing sent to coral and empirical bathymetry processor. There we go. So here again, just we need to select. And now be careful, we do not select the depth invariant indices, but we select the pre-processed product, which was the deglinted and masked product, so number five. There we go. And then when we go to the processing parameters, uh, we have to cho so choose two bands. So it is the same case as for the depth invariant indices. We again choose band two and three, as uh, these give us the best results. And um, we also need to uh, point the um, processor towards our uh, point data set. So first, maybe let me just show you how such data set might look. The data set that we will, so the uh, training and validation data that we will use here are in fact not in situ data, uh, because these are usually quite difficult to come by and they cannot be freely distributed. But um, they were derived by John Headley using a random sampling of um, 20 meter multi-source uh, digital elevation and depth model for Lizard Island, um, uh, created by uh, Leon et al. Uh, with, uh, in 2012. Again, I'll provide you with the, um, with the reference um, at the end of the webinar. So let me just show you how these data look. There we go. So basically, it is um, just a list of uh, comma delimited uh, values of uh, latitude, longitude, and depth um, without any headers. Uh, they are um, limited to values below 20 meters of depth uh, because that is what we can reasonably expect to, for the depth we can reasonably expect to get good results for. Um, after 20 meters, um, there is really no um, reflectance uh, coming back to us, so we cannot really um, map these values with any accuracy. Okay, so this is the data set that we'll use. So I'll just navigate to it here. Okay. And uh, this value, the end value, um, it's basically a um, value that you can select. It's uh, uh, the value of it is not so important. I always use the default. It's just the value that makes sure that the result of the, uh, so the logarithm within the equation that I've shown you is going to be always positive. So you multiply um, the values of the reflectance that you're using um, with this value in order to make, make sure that the values are positive. Uh, that's just that. Let's click run.
There we go. And we can again open, so I just double click and open the product. Um, what I can do is just hide the polygons because we don't need them at this point. We go and also I'll go into a single window view. There we go. So you can see again um, like this uh, it doesn't look like uh, much so we need to tweak the visualization a little bit but we can see basically that the values in the deep areas are um, more or less noise and they are not really um, they are not really giving us all that much information but in the shallower areas uh, we can see that the values um, appear quite nicely. So first thing that we need to do is uh, to actually apply the mask that we have created before because as you see here all these values um, are sort of residual land values, residual cloud values and cloud uh, shade and so on. So let's remove them first. And so to do this I just go and right click to my um, bathymetry product and go to band mouth. And then I type um, okay. you can uh, assign any name to the band you like just uh, for um, for your future reference. Um, again, I unselect virtual and I go to edit expression. And here I will have to go to uh, the previous product, so I have to actually access the product number five, the masked product. But since the products have the same resolution and they have the same extent, I can do that. It is not possible to do this uh, sort of a cross-reference of uh, bands um, in, in case um, the bands are not the same resolution, but I can go here. So it would be number five, where I've created this mask all. And I will type if mask all equals equals one, therefore if the values are valid, then, and now I will go back to my latest bathymetry product, then I want to assign the value that is within the um, original bathymetry band. Else, I will just assign no data. go. So this is my mask bathymetry and I can now go to the color manipulation and load. Uh, I can load a palette that I have prepared before just to have the nicest results. And there we go. Okay and you can see so I have assigned values red is around zero or dark red is around zero and then I have until 20 meters of depth. And here you can see the results. There we go. So I think this result is uh, actually quite nice. And the last thing we will do, we can do a validation. So uh, to do this, I have to load my validation data. So I will load them from CSV. They look very similar to the ones that I used to, to calculate this. I need to choose um, lat long projection. This takes always a little bit um, to actually show the data because there is many of them. There we go. Okay, so um, here we are. And let me just single. and I can choose the scatter plot here and in the scatter plot I can choose point data source to compare my pixel values to is this validation data set that just uh, just loaded it has a column that's called depth there we go and then just to visualize it better I will stretch it like so and I can also show sort of a 15% tolerance. So there we go. So this is my result. You can see that up to approximately 20 meters, which is the maximum that I had in my training data, um, we have a very good agreement.
Uh, we have some outliers here for various reasons. This can be residual errors due to atmospheric correction, bright, bright spots or uh, very dark spots uh, for any reason. Um, so there we go. So this is our result. Of course, it can be improved, but just to show you how this can be done. Okay, perfect. So let me close it. So we are actually running out of time a little bit, so I will be very quick with the last one. And the last one, um, just to go back to the presentation, is the radiometric normalization. Uh, this is useful if you want to do any sort of change detection or, for example, uh, detect color bleaching, which can be done uh, in some cases, but uh, that very much depends on the availability of suitable data uh, within the period. And um, so the radiometric normalization via the uh, pseudo-invariant features. So basically what we need to select first is to choose um, polygons or sample polygons over um, so-called pseudo-invariant features, which do, we do not expect the reflectance to change over the time series. And then uh, we perform uni um, uh, univariate regression between the linear relationships between uh, the S2 bands across time. And we use uh, one, and then we make a linear transformation of the slave image with respect to the master. So for each time series, we will have one master image. And to that, we will intercalibrate the rest of the time series. And the pseudo-invariant features can be, for example, bright sand, village, uh, dark waters, man-made infrastructures, such as uh, airstrips, roofs, and many others. There, of course, you always have to keep in mind what resolution you're using. So if you have a roof, which has uh, several tens of meters, you probably do not want um, to use it for uh, calibrating uh, band one, which is uh, which has a uh, 60 meter resolution in the beginning, but um, yeah, for this purpose. And you can see here the result. So this is actually the uh, result. Um, this has been reported by Hadley et al. in uh, 2012. Um, it's one of the only reported uh, space uh, space uh, scene uh, color color bleach, potential color bleaching events. And it's been um, detected uh, on February 23rd of 2017. I apologize for the error here in the date. It's 2017. And this is the previous image of 2016. So let me go back. And for this, I will use um, the data from the Adelaide Reef. Um, I already have them pre-processed with the Deglind and mass processor and atmospheric correction. And here, just for the purpose of um, the processing being faster, you can see that I already uh, have red polygons here that mark my pseudo-invariant features, so the very deep water. You can mistake them a little bit with the clouds, but um, there we go. And then the bright sand areas over the reef here. So these I will use as the pseudo-invariant features. It's called the vector band is just called, I just let geometry as the name, and I can go to optical, send to coral, and radiometric normalization, PIF. And here you need to select the slave product, so the one that has been going to be calibrated, and the reference product. So for me, the reference product is the number eight from 2016. And the uh, one that I want to calibrate is the one uh, where the bleaching was detected, which is the uh, 2017. Okay, I'm going to save it. And then here, I want to select the bands that will be corrected, which in my case, uh, let's say it's going to be band 2, 3, and 4. Ah, sorry about that. I forgot to write here in reference to the polygons that I'm using. Let's visualize this one. Ah. Um, sorry about that. So last thing that I forgot to explain is that uh, the there is a bug in the software that does not carry um, the invalid pixel expression, which uh, contains um, a reference towards the mask. So I just need to very quickly um, to add the mask uh, from the original product. So the original product is this one. 
the name of the mask is here. It's very important that the name of the mask that you carry forward is going to be exactly the same. And I'll do band math. I will assign the name, remove this, and I will go back to the product eight, oh, sorry, nine, and I'll just choose this one. So I will basically transfer the mask to the new product. There we go. You can close it. And now the RGB should work because it finally can find all the references. And now I could play a little bit with, um, with the values here. Let's see. I will close this one. And just to have them visualize the same way. And now what I could do is go to Windows and oh. and I can now compare the values because I can be more or less sure that uh, when I'm looking that the change that I see here, for example, is related not to the different uh, distribution of the histogram, but to uh, actual change in the surface uh, or in the reflectance. So you can see that here these are very bright and potentially this can be uh, uh, a bleaching event detected by satellite because here you can see that they are very uh, very dark. So this is the first image from 2016 and this is the second one from 2017. So I apologize, we ran over the time a little bit, but hopefully um, I've give you, given you a full picture of Send to Coral, uh, almost full picture anyway. Okay, so uh, basically just to conclude, um, Thank you very much all for attending the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, you can request a virtual machine and repeat this webinar um, on the virtual machine with uh, all the data and everything. You can also, of course, watch the video again and repeat it on your own uh, at any time. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we hope you, you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And see you in one month for the next webinar, which uh, we will announce approximately um, yeah, in mid-June. Uh, okay, thank you very much and bye-bye.